Okay. Am I live? You guys hear me? Excellent. Wonderful. All right. So we're going to push things along. Um, first of all, I get to, I'm excited not just to be here again. My name is John D'Agostino. I'm head of strategy for Coinbase Institutional. I can now cross off speaking after a Nobel on my bucket list. So that's kind of cool. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, all right, we're going we're to dive right in, uh, do very, very brief intros, let our esteemed panelists um, uh, impress you with their intelligence versus their titles. But we've got uh, Matthew Horn, who's head of uh, Fidelity Digital Asset Strategy, and the guy probably responsible for not, being the only one not choosing Coinbase as custodian, right? Was that you? Um, okay, we'll, we'll work on that. Uh, we got Leah Wald, who's the co-founder and CEO of Valkyrie, and I'd be remiss to not point out uh, uh, tech in general has a gender problem, crypto has a worse gender problem, and Leah is a rock star female CEO, and I think she deserves a round of applause for that. Um, and then we got Hong Kim. I'm not going to play favorites, but Hong's the co-founder and CTO at Bitwise. I'm a big, big fan of Bitwise, as well as all the others. Uh, so thanks, Hong, for coming. Uh, you guys have done a great job. We'll talk about kind of the, the, the grunt work that I think you guys have done, which is amazing. OK. So I think I'm going to start with um, Matt and uh, Hong, talk a bit about how the ECFs have evolved. And then, Lee, I want you to get into some of the underlying details about what's happening with, with the uh, pricing asset with Bitcoin. Uh, so Matt, we'll start with you. So, um, you know, the one data point I think is fascinating is, so quick show of hands, so how many people, uh, well, ha so how many people think they know how many people in the, in the U.S. roughly own Bitcoin directly? Who thinks they know that answer? All right, quick, who, what's the number? What do you think? 8 million? Uh, no, 50, around 52 right now. Quick question, how many people think they know how many individuals in the U.S. directly own stock? Not through pension funds, but have purchased a share of stock? <laughs> no, it's about 52 million. So because of the ETFs, Roughly the same percentage of Americans have bought a Bitcoin that have directly bought a share of U.S. stock. That's extraordinary. Um, I think the ETFs saved us, personally, and, and you guys are a big part of that. So, so Matt, walk me through, like, who's buying this stuff? Is this, is this uh, just rebalancing of crypto adherence, or is this new types of enormies finally buying in because of the ETFs? Uh, I'd say it's new. It's new capital coming in. And the ETF story is all about capital accessibility, in my opinion. For years, everyone in this room could go to a crypto exchange as a retail direct investor and purchase you know, Bitcoin. Um, institutional investors, maybe in the last five years, had a much easier experience with platforms like Coinbase and Fidelity and others. Um, but the challenge on the retail side has been it's been mainly taxable money. And a lot of folks, as you all know, have a significant portion of their wealth in retirement type accounts or tax advantage accounts. And really the ETF vehicle, while obviously it's holding spot, ET, uh, spot Bitcoin in the ETF, it's you're not holding Bitcoin directly, you're still getting that exposure directly to, to spot Bitcoin in these accounts where you can really do it easily before. So it's really been a cap capital accessibility story. We're seeing a significant portion of the purchasing in our products in these retirement type accounts. So I'm talking IRAs, uh, health savings accounts, um, self-directed brokerage windows within a 401k, like this was not happening before, you know, these products came to market. So it's very exciting to see. It's a whole new, you know, capital base that can now buy this and help, you know, drive some of those pricing dynamics that Jesse just talked about in the slides before. And, and not only uh, a new group, it's a customer segment that can buy it, it's a massive army of people selling it. And that's the part that folks don't really understand is um, I think historically these assets have been sold, not bought, ETFs, um, and you need that army. And one of the things I've always was, was thinking about um, for years was who are, I call them the killers, who are gonna be the killers, the old school folks who are gonna be dialing the phone, calling their clients. Hong, you guys have done an insanely good job, and I'll go on record saying I think you're a big part of this because for the last five or six years, uh, you know, I know your team, I know Teddy and those guys, very, very quietly have been doing the hard work of sitting down with and we're talking tens of thousands of phone calls, meetings, flying down to Fargo, North Dakota, and sitting in a room with bad coffee, with 19 Morgan Stanley advisors managing $800 million books of business, some of whom don't know what shorting is. I mean, it's that, it's that real. So, so talk a bit about kind of how that distribution process works and how, how the different ETFs can differentiate themselves. Yes, um, it's really great to be here. Um, and it's, I think people are mostly used to kind of the markets or kind of dynamics in the world that they're, um, they, they themselves experience or they themselves see. And so for most of us, it's, we, when we think about investing, we think about our own retirement accounts or brokerage accounts, individual. 
And then you hear about like institutions, like maybe the Harvard endowment is making an investment or something. But actually the reality of most wealth, investment wealth in the US is that they are managed by uh, financial advisors. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that wealth is not like a single decision maker nor like a individual, but rather someone that is managing, let's say has a, has a book of business, it has 50 clients or so, they each have a million dollars or $5 million, et cetera, and it adds up to a meaningful amount. But there's tens of thousands of these people all over the US because they're serving individual families uh, in, in all areas of the United States. So really accessing that wealth that is really the main kind of wall of capital that is not really yet discovered Bitcoin or the investment benefits of Bitcoin, that crowd is not really um, uh, someone that you can simply reach online or some Facebook ads, et cetera. You really have to show up at their door and be willing to sit through a conversation and have a lunch meeting or, or a, um, uh, a dinner steak conversation. And that's the type of thing that Bitwise is actually set up to do. We're about a 60 person firm um, uh, based in San Francisco in New York. And uh, we've been doing this for about six plus years. And really we, we have a 20 person sales team with like eight territories in the United States. And that's all they do. They, they uh, call these people and show up and hold their hand through their investment journey uh, of, of Bitcoin. And so, for example, last year, we did about 20,000 calls and meetings across the US uh, with financial professionals to, to do that type of hand-to-hand -hand combat that you're talking about, yeah. Um, John, yeah, to, yeah, to convince these people. Yeah. It's hard, because you know, it's, it's not just convincing the end user, the buyer. So, so picture this, you're, you're, a, you're a, a financial advisor, Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch. Um, you have a book of business, you have maybe 60, 80 clients. A lot of them made their wealth through selling a business, a, a widget factory. Um, they're not particularly financially sophisticated. They want to keep their mostly in wealth preservation mode. You get to see that client maybe twice a year if you're lucky. So you know you go out in the golf course and you've got you know maybe an hour to discuss business, maybe 30 minutes, and you've got to pick you know the two or three products you want to pitch out of the 90,000 you have access to on that system. So a getting them to a point where they're comfortable pitching the Bitcoin ETF, using that as their one bullet. I got three bullets with this client. Why would I use this one? So getting that financial advisor educated enough to, to speak to the product and then excited enough, because quite frankly, they want to sell products that produce a higher commission. They want to produce structured products, structured. I know when my advisor at Merrill Lynch calls me, they're not calling to sell me ETFs. They're calling to, to sell me stuff that give them a higher commission rate. So that effort takes years to build. It's really, really, really hard. I, I saw that, I used to work for a hedge fund that sold through RIAs, and um, these are, they, they flew a million miles a year to sit down and have those meetings, and it took years and years and years to build that reputation. Um, so, okay, so Leah, um, we just heard an amazing presentation on the halving. Uh, it, I had actually had not thought through the math on that uh, in a long time, so that was, that was a good refresher. Um, that's not the kind of stuff that's probably gonna be compelling to an RIA and a high net worth individual who's out playing golf. Right, so how do we think about explaining the, the structural dynamics and maybe the fears associated with decreasing transaction fees for miners, et cetera, et cetera? How, how do you think that works for the layperson? That's a good and tough question, especially, you know, and, and with this audience and so many Bitcoin holders, and again, right after the slides on uh, the Bitcoin halving, this is what I think to be a very different halving, debatable subject. Um, but a very different having based on what you're saying with transaction fees. We're seeing the ordinals, BRC20s, and we need to be thinking about different things, rare sats, et cetera. But what you're saying is a very simple one. Um, why should uh, the end client buy a Bitcoin ETF? Uh, what makes sense in its simplicity? I'm gonna go back for a second. We used to say different things. We used to talk about the nature of inflation hedge. We used to always say store value. We'd say deflationary asset. Um, we would say a couple other things. We would try to bring up the having, and eyes would glaze. So we would then skip over the having. I think that at this point, now that we have the ETF structures, it's become a lot easier. Why do I think ETF structures are easier? Yes, it's tax advantaged. Um, it is a premium wrapper, but it's more comfortable to trade and hold in an investment portfolio in a manner that a money manager is used to trading, holding, and investing in. Whether it's you know allocating within 
uh, the amount that they're used to allocating to ETFs, whether again, it's a bit more sophisticating on stops and loss uh, limits. Um, they can trade it and invest in it according, again, to what they know about that structure and, and how they have in the past. Prior to that, whether it's buying spot uh, on Coinbase, on the many exchanges, um, Fidelity had a great integration. Coinbase, actually, I think it was uh, overlooked, but the integration with Aladdin um, was absolutely incredible. However, uh, that is scary. And what financial advisors want is simple. Um, as mentioned, they have <laughs> tens of thousands of options to think about yep. with very similar volatility, actually much worse volatility, yet they pick them because they're comfortable with what they know. A biotech microcap is something that they know how to invest in and how to allocate within their portfolio. This is new and it scared them for a long time. Yep. But again, if we want to think uh, apples to apples. Now we have a structure that they can fit similar to um, the microcraft strategy that they've had in the past. So uh, what do we say to advisors? I know this is a long-winded answer, so I apologize for that. Not at all. Um, I think based on the having slide, it still is that this, and I love the, the way that he put it, uh, programmable um, store of value. Um, so now you're looking at, again, if you're looking at a long-term investment thesis, the economics are there to prove that this is a store of value. Um, and then whether you're trading or your trading strategies are different, um, you know, obviously there's other principles for that. I, I, I really appreciate you saying, um, talking about kind of the portfolio characteristics of where this might fit, because one of my pet peeves is when folks selling Bitcoin, uh, particularly with, with pension funds and large sovereign pools of capital, they'll talk about, well, this is this incredible right tail asset, and this has the ability to go up 10,000 times, and therefore you have to have it be a 25 or 50 basis point position. That, that, that's ludicrous, by the way, because if, if, if A, if you believe, a, that's not how pension funds invest. They don't buy lottery tickets. That's just not what they do. So going into that conversation, um, it, it belies a misunderstanding of how pension funds invest. Secondly, if they did invest that way, there is other stuff, as you pointed out, right? I used to trade natural gas options, right? That's why I'm not scared of Bitcoin volatility. Like, it's nothing compared to natural gas options. So there's lots and lots of things. If, if an advisor has somebody who says, I want to have a right tail risk asset and put 50 basis points into it and have it go up 10,000% maybe, there's other stuff. Um, now, I think Bitcoin has um, uh, tremendous qualities that make it as good as those others, if not better. But, but again, I think this realization that not everyone is in the bubble and you have to start building products that flow seamlessly into these portfolios and not everyone is going to be okay with it, I think is, is an important thing. Now, I, I was skeptical of the adoption rate of the Bitcoin ETF. I was telling everyone, like, stop talking about it because it's not going to be, because this thundering herd of, of, of sellers you need to do to, to make this happen, I didn't think outside of Bitwise, anyone else was putting in the work. But then when we saw brands like Fidelity and BlackRock, um, I was thrilled to be wrong about this. So go back to you, Matt. So why, why do you think it was such an insane success? Because it, it, it absolutely, I mean, it's, it's broken. It clearly is top one or two all-time ETF launches, even if you account for the grayscale crossover. Mm -hmm. what, what was it? Because it was, there wasn't a tremendous amount of time to prepare. True. It was a very unique launch in the ETF industry. We may never see something like that again, where you have 10 issuers going at once for one category. So much anticipation. Um, I think the approval helps legitimize Bitcoin in some people's minds as, a, as an asset class, right? So I think that's part of it. Um, I think, obviously, the previous products were private trusts that traded at premiums and discounts. Those were inefficient for many people. Spot Bitcoin ETFs give you actual price return very close to NAV, right? So that's what people really wanted. Yep. Um, this is why I'm super bullish, though, is because everything we've seen so far, John, is retail for the most part. We have the early edge of advisor adoption, but the types of platforms you're talking about, the Merrills, the, the wirehouses, the big platforms are still... Yep. not approving these products for advisory. So yep. it's still early days. So there's still, call it 30 plus trillion in advisory capital in the US that still can't access these you know, easily you know, on their platform. So that's, that's coming. The, the work is being done by you know, Hong's team and my team and other teams. Yep. That's going to come. So this is why I'm very excited is because they've been a massive success and it's only been really mainly retail driven with some advisory and some institutional capital on the edge. And I'll throw one more data point out. I just got back from uh, the UAE. Uh, and everything you're reading is true. The floods were as bad as possible. I and mean, I knew Bitcoin, I knew blockchains were immutable. I didn't think they were waterproof. Um, and uh, what I said before about sovereigns having a problem buying spot Bitcoin, I think is correct. However, 
Um, I can tell you right now from conversations I had last week with Adia and others, because of what the ETF is doing, not necessarily, they won't necessarily hold the ETF, but one of the problems that Bitcoin's had, if you think of it like I do, as, and I know as Adia does, uh, as a commodity, um, commodities have structural users. They have structural hedgers. So like there's a natural seller and buyer of the jet fuel contract. Um, yeah, there's a natural seller and buyer of natural gas contracts, like Sara Lee Corporation. You don't think of them as a commodity trading firm, but they bake muffins. They have to buy natural gas to bake muffins. They're short natural gas. There's structural users. Bitcoin never had that. The miners were kind of the only thing that were there, but then they were hodling. So the ETFs have now synthetically replaced those structural consumers of Bitcoin. It now resembles, given the scale, more of, a, of an understandable commodity contract and the sovereigns can start to think of it that way. Mm -hmm. So they're now looking at taking core positions one to 5% in Bitcoin, which would be extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So that's all, that's fantastic. So um, uh, Hong, maybe let's continue this conversation about like, why do you think the success, and I know you guys put the work in, uh, but were you surprised? Yes and no. Okay. Um, but I also just wanna say to the, this audience, I think a lot of people here uh, are not just interested in kind of financial markets or kind of financialization of Bitcoin, are, but are here because they're really fans of what this asset and network is. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, like, even as an ETF issuer, I just want to say that, like, ultimately ETFs are like a, a, a sliver of what's happening uh, in the Bitcoin world and what Bitcoin represents. And ultimately, if, if ETFs were the only thing that existed uh, in Bitcoin, then Bitcoin as a value prop, the Bitcoin as... Uh, the kind of revolutionary thing that um, that we have in our hands would not exist or would not be possible. Mm. Um, so uh, uh, the fact that you can custody it yourself, the fact that you can transact uh, without anyone's permission, uh, and, and the fact that, you, that, that it is a monetary supply that users control uh, mm -hmm. that is based on open source software, those are the things that are really actually completely... Uh, revolutionary about Bitcoin. Sure. And I think ETFs are, are just take um, a stack on top of all of that because it, it, it is what it is, because it is like a zero to one moment, because it has so many people that care about it, mm -hmm. uh, even if they don't own it at times. Um, that fan base and that kind of provenance of what it is, is I think ultimately what is doing most of our work we, we have 20,000 phone calls and meetings last year, but there are millions and millions of people in the United States. We're not reaching everyone. Yeah. The, the reality is that Bitcoin is, is kind of propagating itself. It is converting minds on itself. And we are, uh, in some ways, we are doing our work, but we're also beneficiaries of all the interest and education that everyone in this room is doing to their friends and family. And what we always find really surprising is that even in like these really um, financial professionals like Wall Street firms, you go in and there might be uh, 12 people or so, and, and many of them might be skeptical, but there's usually always one or two people that are in that meeting. They might be junior people, they might be senior people, mm -hmm. but that are actually really ex Bitcoiners through and through, and they're not letting their orange colors like shine through the whole way, but they're, they're in that meeting actually on your side. And then after the meeting, maybe they might debrief with you about how to better pitch their firm. Like, what other asset is like that? If you sell like yep. oil options, you yeah. don't have that experience. Not so I think that type of thing is really what's so different about Bitcoin yeah. and what makes people kind of underestimate Bitcoin because they don't understand that. If you're just sitting on a Wall Street desk without the understanding of like how much of a movement Bitcoin is, then you're like, wow, what happened here? But, but, but if you do understand that, then I think to some extent this amount of excitement or activity is to be expected of, of a, a kind of radical thing yeah. as Bitcoin. It is the first, I, I'm, in my career, it's the first uh, financial asset meme. Um, it has the virality of, of a meme. It's really, it's really extraordinary. I mean, when my mother's calling me, my mother doesn't even use online banking, and she's calling me asking about Bitcoin, so it's amazing. Um, yeah, what this, else yeah. is that? Like, yeah. happens. Like, nothing else yeah. really like engenders that amount of passion and interest in people. Right. Yeah. In, in fairness, so the contrarians will point to that and say it's a cult. <laughs> um, 
I, I know I, I, I struggle with kind of the counter argument around that. So, so Leah, um, um, let's talk about some of the, again, some of these underlying things. So, so everyone was expecting the having to crush uh, minor transaction fees. And shockingly, it has not worked out that way, at least for the first 24 hours. Uh, minor fees are, are doing pretty darn well. But how do you think about explaining that, if people have concerns around that? How do you, how do you, how do you explain that way to people? How should they think about that? If, if miners are the social utility that allow for the transactions to occur, and there's all this media about how they're just going to get crushed, and there's going to be just massive uh, um, turmoil amongst the miners, like how, how do you explain that to the person on the golf course who just sold their business and has heard, oh, this, this might be problematic? Well, great question on the back of Hong. Now my, you know, my Bitcoin hack is it had is back on, and especially since you're bifurcating, and I think that's right. The um, the financial advisors that may be secretly wearing orange underneath, and the financial advisors that are complete new coiners and haven't actually bought yet, you know, and those may be completely different conversations. Um, I bring that up because for the minor transaction fees it will be meaningful to some people and not to others. Um, for those that are down the rabbit hole, I think that there's actually concerns and a lot of excitement. There's a lot of excitement around developers building on Bitcoin again. Um, now, we've always, uh, and a huge you know, hat tip to all of Bitcoin Core that has you know, been around, that has been securing the network. Um, I cannot thank you all enough. That is why we're here, and thank you for your continued work. What you've seen now is just a renaissance of uh, builders from the Ethereum network um, and other decentralized protocols wanting to build on Bitcoin. Whether this will be a failed experiment, whether there will be uh, scary ramifications for the base layer um, to your you know, question of transaction fees becoming very high, post having it's millions of dollars. Yeah. You had 37.6 Bitcoin in the transaction fee on the halving right after the halving block so quite spectacular. Now, if the financial advisor is actually asking about what's happening with the transaction fees, I can imagine that means that it's starting to creep into the products and that the products are potentially already seeing something that's uh, maybe systematically an issue. Mm. Um, there could be structural issues with the Bitcoin ETFs in the future that we would need to solve. And that's okay. There's solutions for you know, challenges all the time. But if transaction fees stay as high as they are and we aren't able to integrate Lightning and other L2 solutions, it could creep into the structured products that we're building into the ETFs as transaction costs are necessary for spot underlying. You may then see something different on the paper products, uh, even the futures versus the spot products. And mm -hmm. there may be a switch to in-kind. There may be a, a new... Uh, technology needed for matching APIs rather than movements and on-chain. Things can stay off-chain. So there are solutions, but I would say that it, it, it would be a comfortable conversation to that um, golf course uh, financial advisor, RAA, um, on there are solutions to this um, and that it's you know the latest development. Um, but I, I yep. just to bring back one thing that you said, you did mention sovereigns, endowments, insurance, you know, these are uh, larger institutions, and if they're managing, you know, uh, managing pensions, the CalPERS of the world, um, that's correct. This is going to be a much, much longer tail. Yeah. Um, because let's let's be clear, even the CIO of these firms have many, many other bosses and investment yep. committees that they need to go through. And sometimes they actually, with their risk parameters, can do too well and need to downsize their positions. Um, so there's there's... The inning is early. Uh, we're not yet on most of the mm -hmm. platforms. That means that the intermediary market that Bitwise has been doing these brilliant calls for is still not even in yet. It's starting to flow in, um, and that's just more exciting, but that could put more stress on the network. But I yep. think that there are solutions that will be integrated. You're 100% right. There, there are tons of solutions. I think it's, so, it's unfair that uh, people selling uh, this asset have to explain the technicals more than any other asset because... Some of the solutions you're talking about are exist in the commodities markets, and but no one who goes long crude oil asks me to explain like ETPs or exchange for physical. Like there's this whole complex mechanism that exists, or how the options price or swap options impact spot at the wellhead. Like no other asset class has to justify its existence to the degree that this one does. So it's 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 unfair, but it's kind of where we are. 
Um, and I appreciate that. And I, and I am I am optimistic around large pools of capital taking core positions. I just think that the industry has to be thoughtful about how it approaches those large pools of capital because it's a very, very different conversation. Also, the, the CIOs of those pensions, they don't get paid for beating their benchmarks, but they get fired if they don't. Um, and they also have a massive headline risk issue. Um, it's really unfair. They could, be, they could match their benchmark and, and satisfy their pensioners' requirements. And if they have one thing that loses money spectacularly, one failed hedge fund investment, even though the rest of their portfolio outperformed, the governor calls them up and says, you're out of this very cushy job. Um, okay, we're gonna go to questions, right? Questions now, we got to the, we have a nice chunk of time for questions. Uh, your hand was up first, but then you put it down. Are you still interested? Okay, okay. Oh, you're gonna pick the questions or you want? Okay. Just talk out loud, yeah. Okay. What dangers do you guys Bitcoin ETFs poses to Bitcoin because Hong, you kind of alluded to like the beauty and excitement of all of this is that you can self custody it and that this can, this is like a sovereign form of money. Or you can host it at Coinbase. Well, fair enough. But you know, but if everyone hosted it on, if everyone had it on Coinbase, then it's not sovereign money anymore, right? Like if there's a single point of failure, we run the risk of causing the same problem that we're trying to solve. So yeah, I guess like, yeah, I, yeah that's a question. Who wants, to, who wants to take that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think the way to think about it is similarly to the fact that uh, we've had centralized exchanges as part of the Bitcoin kind of um, uh, set, set up for a long time. And it is, it is often a journey for all the investors where, where you start with the easiest thing and then maybe you experience a lot of uh, price appreciation and the thing now becomes a meaningful chunk of your net, net worth and then you start thinking about it and you're paying attention and then, and then you uh, think about buying a hardware wallet mm -hmm. and, and self-custody, et cetera. So, so often it's a journey and I, and I think what ETF represents is just kind of like making it much further e easier, like radically easier that you don't even have to open up another account. To, like usually the, 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 the journey is like you need to open up an account on a Coinbase or a Kraken, et cetera. And it, um, the ETFs kind of represent a situation where most people have some sort of brokerage account and they can just one click buy. And that can be the, the kind of the simplest journey. So I, th I think that's the kind of the upside. The downside is that if that's where things end, then, then you're right. If that's where it ends for everyone, every new investor just starts there because it's easiest and that's where it's end for everyone, then it is uh, 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 a tough spot for, for Bitcoin's future. So I, I think what we need to enable, and something that like, I care a lot about, is that the, the, the ideal thing for ETFs is that ETFs have in-kind withdrawals that are enabled. So there are gold ETFs where if you want just not to sell your gold shares, but rather just have gold coins delivered to your door, that's the way that you can redeem from the ETF as well. So, my ideal end state for the ETFs is, is where you can do that. Um, uh, then, then it's at kind of closer to parity with what we experience with exchanges right now, where um, that can be the easy, easy buy option, but then as you are educated and as your position grows and as you want, you're, you're ready to take sovereignty of that, then you can off-ramp um, uh, in, in an in-kind way as well. Please, please, as well, absolutely. I, I think it's yeah. a really meaningful uh, question that you're asking. Um, U.S. ETFs, and I, I think none of us are going to blow smoke here. Uh, U.S. ETFs are great. It's a wonderful vehicle. It was needed. It is a fraction of the world using Bitcoin and the purposes of why people use Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. I got into Bitcoin from work that I did at the World Bank with M-Pesa, if anyone's familiar, SMS-based microfinance, microloan systems. This technology has been around for a while. Look a it up those... if you're not familiar. It's extraordinary. I didn't know you were involved in that. Congratulations. It's an extraordinary success. Yeah, yeah. Uh, fascinating. And then there's even yeah. pictorial ways of doing it. And these same people who have needed Bitcoin have bought Bitcoin and still use Bitcoin. Whether you look at other conflict zones in the world, from Afghanistan to Venezuela, um, there's, you, you know, they use stable coins now too, but they also are using Bitcoin for that store of value principle. They are, you know, maybe buying on Coinbase, but they're probably not buying our, our ETFs right now. And that's fantastic and perfectly fine because Bitcoin was created for each person. So I think that this is the vehicle that we needed. Uh, and again, in three, four years, we're going to see the rest of those sovereigns, endowments, insurance, yep. et cetera. 
But um, to your point, I, th I don't think it uh, negates any of the beauty of why Bitcoin's pillars exist for the immutabil immutability, permissionless value transfer, et cetera, and, and the rest of the world is still using it for those effects. Quick, quick, I'm just, Rick, you're, you're going uh, and, and to stump everyone with a technical question. I am curious, because I love optionality of self-custody, but ra raise your hand if you believe in primarily self-custody. And keep, it, keep them up. OK. Now, now, I want honestly answer me this question, because I'm not trying to be sarcastic here. Keep your hands up if you believe in primarily self-custody. How many of you with your hands up genuinely believe that in your life, God forbid something were to happen to you, there is a person that you trust enough with a bearer asset who has the technical ability to take it and pass it on to who you want to pass it on to. Keep your hand up. Okay, a lot of you dropped your hand. That's my issue. I'm not looking to start, and I love the optionality, but that's what I struggle with, is ultimately you are trusting someone. You're trusting a third party. Um, and uh, look at my face, I'm very trustworthy. Um, no, uh, but it's amazing that, it, that this is the only asset with that sort of portability and immutability. Okay, um, Rick, we got you, and then, okay. Yeah. I understand mining economics that yesterday $4 of power would have created $10 of Bitcoin for the average hasher. Um, but that now half that $4 creates $5 still profitable. Tell me about transaction fees as a one of ten euro. I know about the stack language under Bitcoin. I'm sorry, does that have anything to do with it? So what are transaction fees and how do miners will never earn them? Uh, you just care for your Understanding, but my director is I just no idea. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm about them, but I know that they're going to be more important as miners. So, yes. Yeah, so, so um, uh, transactions fees are necessary because we have a scarce resource, uh, which is the block space that is available roughly every 10 minutes, uh, that everyone is trying to engage to. Uh, either settle a transaction or these days inscribe some sort of data into. And so globally, permissionlessly, uh, people are competing to get their transaction uh, into this scarce space that we all share together. And uh, there is a way in which we decide who gets to include their transaction into a block every, um, and that, that gating factor that we use to decide is basically an auction. Uh, there's a price uh, uh, that people can pay for their transaction. And so um, that's what's happening roughly every 10 minutes. And the fees are high uh, because uh, there's a lot of people that want to do things on the Bitcoin blockchain at the moment. And if there are less people that are fighting for the same uh, scarce resource, then fees would go down. So it's high because of ordinals. Runes is, I guess, maybe a more specific uh, answer to the current moment because that's okay. what was launched uh, at the having. Um, don't want to take too much attention to runes because, it, to some extent, it's it's really a sideshow, mm -hmm. and to some extent, it's we have to see how sustainable it is as a kind of permanent element of the minor economics. Uh, but yes, we did see a 37. Bitcoin transaction fee block in the first block, and then it, it kind of sustained itself in like 20, 20 Bitcoin, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So in some ways, it was kind of like a doubling rather than a halving for Bitcoin miners uh, last night. And it's, it's quite a, a sight to behold. Yeah. But I, I think to some extent, it is uh, there has been, so, so, so in generally in like broader crypto world, there's a lot of speculative energy that, that is excited to uh, uh, take a bet on a, a new token or a meme coin, et cetera. It's, it's all the rage on Solana, and it has been in the past in Bitcoin. And I think some of that energy is finding its way back to Bitcoin through runes and ordinals as well. I don't personally think that is necessarily a bad thing, but also it's, it's a hard thing to, to say that that is like, uh, uh, it's hard to know if that is going to permanently change the economics for miners mm -hmm. or, or, or something temporary. Um, yeah. Okay. So I enough. think we should have kind of moderated excitement about it rather than thinking that okay. that, that is okay. something. Yeah. We, we have time for one more one more question. Sorry. No. Yeah, one, last question. one last question. We have a student. Is there a student maybe that that wants to ask a question? This is the last one. No. Okay. This guy really wants to ask questions. So so uh, <laughs> he's been you all, your shoulder okay? You've been shooting yeah. up there. You got you're right? Yeah. I'm Zeke from Amber Group. I have a question about ETF operations. 
so this is um, ETF is a uh, very important uh, buying power. Uh, someday it buy 10,000 Bitcoins per day. Uh, but everybody are guessing what's the inflow outflow a few hours after the market closing. So my question is why ETFs can release, cannot release the inflow outflow information in real time. Could you explain uh, why yeah, was sure. that? Yeah. It's a, it's, yeah, I can't be able to. Yeah. Um, he's asking about when there's demand, so creation activity in the ETF, uh, why can't we disclose in real time that buying and selling during the day? So these are all cash create redeem. They're not in kind right now. Most ETFs are in kind. So what happens essentially is authorized participant says, hey, there's demand to create shares in an ETF. Um, cash comes into the issuer, so into the trust. Then it's on the issuer, either whether it's Bitwise or Fidelity or whoever, has to then go work with liquidity providers, Coinbase, whoever, um, to purchase <laughs> to purchase the Bitcoin. And obviously, like th there could be substantial, you know, trade information there, right? So we would yeah. never want to disclose when that activity is taking place because it would be market sensitive information that could impact, you know, pricing, right? And, and they're they're cash versus in kind because of the SEC. Because the SEC, yeah, right? we are supposed to be all in kind. Yeah, yeah. I mean, most ETFs are in kind. We thought this would have been in kind as well, but last minute, yeah. you know, we had to make a pivot. So. Point being is like there's active trading going on. We would not want to disclose that information in real time. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys.